Welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for another hour of good gardening. If you have questions, you can give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. Our master gardeners will be happy to help you. If you'd like to submit a question or a picture for a future show, our email address is byf at unl.edu. We do need to know where you live and tell us as much as you can about your issue. You can also keep up with Backyard Farmer during the week on our Facebook page. You can watch past shows and our featured content on our YouTube channel. As always, we like to start the show with a few samples. And Kate, you have a creature that I know a lot of people are not going to be happy to see. Yes, so today I brought with me some cabbage looper caterpillars. And so cabbage looper caterpillars, they'll feed on crucifers, cabbage, broccoli, mustard, radish, and the like. And they're really prevalent right now. And a lot of people are seeing large holes in their cabbage. Um, and to control these guys, you can see there's a couple different sizes here. We have some small caterpillars and some large ones. And to control the small caterpillars, a spray application of BT works really well against them. BT or Bacillus thuringiensis is really specific to caterpillars. It won't harm non-targets like predators or uh, pollinators. And then for these larger guys that we see right here, those you can just simply hand pick off, crush them, throw them to soapy water to take care of that. These guys also will turn into moths eventually and those moths lay eggs on the underside of the leaves. So we recommend things like floating row covers to prevent moths from laying eggs. Um, sorry, that little <laughs> one's doing a little dance for me. Um, and then lastly, just um, general garden cleanup in the fall. These guys will pupate in the leaf litter around the plants. So make sure that you're cleaning that up to prevent next year's moths from emerging. Well, and uh, nothing worse than nice head of cabbage or broccoli, and there's a little protein in there. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kate. All right, Rock, what it, that's not turf or a, a weed. You know, oddly, I'm not going to have a turf sample tonight, so that's kind of strange. But um, this is redbud. It's one of our natives, a native legume tree, a uh, brilliant color in the fall, in the, excuse me, in the spring, and really pretty in the landscape. Um, but... Uh, this one has what we, we consider this redbud to be one of our indicator plants of pesticide drift or pesticide injury. And this one clearly has some in injury on it. If we look down at, at the base, they're cupped, they're leathery, they feel leathery, all the things that indicate there's some herbicide injury here. But we, we know that red buds are extremely resilient. And, you know, all the time we hear people saying, oh, no, it's going to, you know, this plant's going to die. And, and the reality of it is, is when we get into the newer leaves, which are always, you know, at the end of the branch, and these are drooping because, you know, they've been in, in my office for the day. But if you look at these, these are pretty healthy leaves. They're not showing any cupping. So these are newly emerged leaves. So this is probably when... Um, the, the 2,4-D or similar phenoxy types or benzoic acid types was sprayed, hence the damage down below. But this tree is going to be fine. And this is actually out of my yard. And we see injury like this. Uh, I try to avoid spraying in the backyard because we have two really nice red buds. But at the end of the day, there's, there's going to be some drift because um, 2,4-D and products like that are so ubiquitous in nature. They're in the air, they're that sort of thing. So this tree's going to be fine. And the beauty and resiliency of our, our na many of our native trees and, and even some of our ornamentals is that they are resilient and it'll recover fine. And, and there's nothing to be worried about. It looks kind of off, off color a little bit. Those leaves drop off, add to the organic matter on the surface, and we're all good. Perfect. Thank you, Rock. All right, Amy, uh, giant cone flower. What do giant we have going flower. on here? Well, luckily, this was just outside the door today. Um, so we're looking at Echinacea today for something a little bit different. We're going to look at the end of the petals here. They're black. They're brown in coloration. And we're actually looking at Botrytis white. Mm. Typically, we talk about Botrytis affecting our flocks, our peonies in particular, our roses. But Botrytis really doesn't care. Um, as these petals are getting older, this is an opportunity for that fungus to come and move in. And typically we don't have major issues with it. If you wanted to do something fun, you could put this head in a Ziploc bag uh, with a little damp paper towel. And I guarantee you within a day, you're gonna see all that nice gray fuzzy growth um, on these petals. So the big thing is with our cone flowers or echinacea growing like crazy and blooming like crazy, we still wanna think about deadheading. Um, we wanna remove this inoculum away. So that way, if we get really wet conditions again, um, three, four inch rains and we're cloudy, you're not gonna see a major decline of your cone flowers because of the botrytis coming in and attacking those petals. 
All right, thanks, Amy. I wasn't really aware that Botrytis it's, attacked coneflower. So. I don't see it that often, so. Excellent. <laughs> All right, Kate, first round of questions is yours. Uh, the first one is so cool. We have two pictures on this. His question is, what insect builds capsules out of green leaves to protect the eggs? Found them in the end of a drain hose for his rain barrel, and they all had little yellow eggs in them, and they were wrapped in a circular pattern within the hose with more leaves. Yeah, so this is a really cool picture. This is, these are cells created by a solitary bee called the leaf cutter bee. So the bee provisions these by cutting leaves um, off of plants with their mouth parts in these circular discs. And then in each of these cells that they make, they'll lay one egg and all that yellow stuff you actually see is pollen. So they'll provision mm -hmm. it with pollen and then when the larva hatches, that's what they'll eat. And solitary bees, like the leafcutter bees, there's really not a sting risk associated with them. Um, they can sting, but they're not like honeybees. They don't have the same social structure. They're solitary, and they nest in wood and holes and in the soil. That's really cool to see those. That's fun. All right, your next one. Uh, this is a Bellevue viewer. Found these bumps on a twig that fell out of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So this is another insect called the Kermes scale, the Kermes oak scale. And this is kind of cool because what you're seeing here are actually the female scales. So the females, when they're mature, they're immobile. They don't have legs. They don't have wings. They kind of just sit there. And they have these piercing, sucking mouth parts that they'll drink the sap from the plant. And so um, about late summer, these females are going to be laying eggs that are going to be hatching sometime in September, maybe into October. And when those eggs hatch, that is the prime time to treat because those are going to be the mobile scales. They're called crawlers. Um, so at that time, you can treat with a pyrethroid like bifenthrin or permethrin. Um, and then you can also apply a systemic in the fall like a metacoprid to help take care of these too. All right, uh, your next one actually comes to us from Hershey, Nebraska. Been seeing this little guy in the garden, wants to know, is it a good guy or a bad guy? So this is a good guy in some sense. This is a <laughs> um, longhorn milkweed beetle, and they're very common on milkweed right now. I was in the garden yesterday, and I think I saw one on every single milkweed plant. And while they do eat the milkweed, they don't cause that much damage, and they're not going to kill the plant, so I would just leave them be. It's just a beautiful native insect. All right, and one final one, and this is from McCook. Friend or foe? This would be a friend. This is actually the exoskeleton or the exuvium of a mayfly. So I suspect that a body of water is probably nearby because immature mayflies are aquatic. And what they do is they emerge from the water and they emerge in mass. And they're pretty unique because they only live for several hours to several days as adults. You know, they don't have mouth parts, they don't feed. They're simply adults just to mate and lay eggs and start that life cycle all over again. All right, excellent. Some fun pictures tonight. Mayflies are like trout fishermen's dream. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. I love mayflies for that. They're, they're <laughs> a great the, indicator. Says the fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Rock, your first one here is uh, Omaha. And this weed shows up. Uh, each summer right about now, he's tried multiple applications of tenacity. He suspects it uh, just comes every single year. What is this? Yeah, this is nimble will, um, and which is a really fine leafed, warm season grass, you know, so it goes off color, um, you know, usually with the first frost or thereabouts, long before the fescue or the bluegrass does. Uh, the interesting thing is, is they're using the right product, mesotrione or tenacity as they called it, which is the trade name, but mesotrione is a really good active ingredient to use. It also has pre-emergent activity on, on nimble will as well. So if you would put it on, um, you know, when it germinates, which is, you know, late May, early June, um, which you don't see it at that point in time. And then again, when you first start seeing it, you'll get this under control, but it, it stays up underneath the, underneath the canopy and is really difficult to see and get really good contact. So a combination of meso, mesotrion, excuse me, in, this, in the spring, followed by applications when you see it in mid to late summer would be, would be your best bet. All right, excellent. Your next two pictures come to us from the, the panhandle. And uh, the question is, what is this grass? It was in a lawn, but they've seen it in some pastures, potentially. 
Yeah, this is Bermuda grass. I'm pretty confident this is Bermuda grass. I don't see rhizomes on it, and if it had rhizomes, I would say definitively, but the longer inner node, the really coarse stem, the northern types of Bermuda grass, which is normally not winter tolerant here, especially in eastern Nebraska, but out west, um, it probably does relatively well. And it could be, you know, the birds use it for nesting material, so they could be moving it out and about. Um, but this, I'm pretty confident this is uh, Bermuda grass. I don't know if they mentioned wanting to control it, and I'm glad they didn't because you can't do anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take over the world, Bermuda grass. All right, and your final two pictures. Uh, she just moved to a place where the lawn is not one, it's weeds. Uh, if she thought she could get by with it, she'd tear the whole thing up. Anyway, this one weed is very abundant. She thought it was brome, but no M or W on the leaf blades. No, and, and you know, her, her thinking it was brome because I would really like a closer picture of that or a more lengthy picture. But I think from this, I can tell it's it's one of the coarser forge type fescues. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it is not a turf type fescue and there are plenty of those and that go around. This is gonna need to be sprayed out because it's gonna continue to be aggressive and definitely needs to be mowed because if it starts producing seed, you're gonna have more where you had less, right? So that's that's a, a non-turf type um, K31 type fescue mm -hmm. or a fawn type fescue and they are ugly and bunchy and not appropriate for lawns. All right, thanks, Rock. All right, Amy, um, your first several are raspberries and blackberries. Mm -hmm. The first one comes to us as a, you know a sample here. There were two pictures. This is the best of them. The leaves were curled and very brittle. Haven't uh, noticed any insects, but it is this disease based. So there are a few diseases that will go after those leaves, but typically with it turning that brown and crispy, I would maybe lean to looking down at the cane. Um, but I would also suggest that you look for insect damage, um, aphids in particular they will force that leaf to curl around, and if they're piercing, sucking too much, we'll get that brown All right. coloration. So maybe occur. not disease and probably not. Ma yeah. yeah. And then your next three are actually blackberries. This is from Elmwood, uh, cane death. He says the primal canes are dying off one at a time about every two to three weeks. When they wilt, there's a small attachment at the crown and it's rotten or something. The rest Some of the plant is healthy. So it looks like there's a potential of multiple things going on. So the first of the three pictures, you can see dark lesions, and you can see it here a little bit on that cane itself. So most likely we're looking at a, there you go, in between the, the crown and that first leaf, you see those dark colorations in there. That probably is an indication that you have cane blight, which is a fungal disease, very common to find in rambles. Um, sanitation is one of the biggest things to do with that. But we could also be looking at way that crown is looking. I would really check to make sure how wet it is. Mm -hmm. uh, we could be really looking at a crown rot. That's the reason why you keep seeing canes um, dying one at a time, it being soft and mushy. And if it is wet, pull the mulch back as far as you can, dry it out. Um, and if we get another three or four inch rain, depending on where you're at, you want to make sure it's draining properly because um, blackberries don't like to be real wet. All right, thanks, Amy. You know, every week we are here to talk about growing plants the right way, but we thought we'd share a really neat project that one of our camera operators did recently. Dan Smith and his wife decided they needed some creative space and some storage in their yard, so they built a really nice craft garden shed. So we have a really small garage here in central Lincoln and uh, we wanted to get all the gardening stuff out of the garage and into, into the shed and near the, the vegetable garden. And also my wife uh, does a lot of potting. She loves potting plants and that kind of stuff. And we'd have to pull out uh, saw horses and a board to get her potting station going and, and uh, tear it down and set it up and stuff. So we wanted a permanent spot for her to do her potting. So we wanted to make a, a potting shed and a storage shed both, and that's what we came up with. So we looked at kits, and there's nothing wrong with kits. You can get a really nice kit out there and stuff, but it just wasn't what we wanted. We wanted a little more character or a little more um, style or a little more uh, cuteness maybe, if you will. Uh, so we built it from scratch. Uh, we went on, on the internet, my father and, my, and me, my dad, and uh, watched a couple of videos and stuff. So we kind of had the same vernacular, knew what we were talking about to each other. And then we just kind of figured it out. Uh, uh, I did some 
back of the envelope designing and then went to the big box store and made my order of wood and the uh, attendant at the big box store helped me. He said, well, you need this and you need a couple other things. And so you, they helped you figure some stuff out and we just went at it. The, the design kind of changed as we went along, but that was part of the fun of it to sort of engineer it and figure it out as we were going. And we've always enjoyed doing home improvement and those kind of projects. So uh, it was fun to do too. My wife and I were talking about, oh, I think a Dutch door would be really cute on the, on the shed. Uh, oh, but we don't want to ask dad to do that. That's too big of a project. And then my pop and I were talking about it and he said, well, how about I build you a Dutch door for the front here? So he built that from, uh, from scratch. And so that's something that we really enjoy and think is neat because dad built it. And also the window boxes here, you know, they're something a shed doesn't need, but they're awful fun to have and they're awful cute to, to have on the shed. And then the other feature that we really like is that is that there's a separate uh, spot for the mower. So the mower has its own little garage and it gets away from everything else and you don't have to have the mess of the mower inside your, inside your shed. If you're gonna do it like I did it and, and do it a little bit by the seat of your pant, pants, there's gonna be more expenses that come up. I sort of guessed what it was gonna cost and it ended up costing more than what I, what I, what I guessed. But that's all part of it when you, when you do something a little fancy like this. So I would say, I would say that's a factor to, to remember. If, uh, if you wanna know what it's gonna cost, you better figure out what you're doing beforehand, you know? Um, and just have fun with it. These things are to have fun in and to enjoy and, uh, and uh, we enjoy our backyard. We sit back here a lot. So it's fun just to look at and, and play with. So have fun with it. All right, thanks Dan and I am really jealous. I want one and I want you to build it for me. <laughs> All right, Kate, your next set of questions. This is a Central City, Nebraska viewer. Uh, what is this insect and what will control it? They're on the roses and eating the flowers and the leaves. And then your second picture here is Unadilla. And they always have uh, seen a healthy population of Japanese beetles. Now they have a new host. And apparently this is half of the Japanese beetles they removed from their aronia berries in one morning. So the question, of course, and I'm sure you're getting it yeah. too, is what to do about Japanese beetles? Yes, so Japanese beetles are back and there are a lot of them. Um, right now, this time of year, the best thing you can do is go out in the evening, get a bucket of water, put some soap in that, and then just throw the beetles in the water and knock them off the plant into there. Kill as many adults as you can. There are a couple of insecticide options, such as bifenthrin or carbaryl. Those will give you about two weeks of protection until you need to apply again. More organic options are going to be neem or pyola. Those are gonna give you about one week of protection. Um, I think in that first picture, we saw them attacking flowers. And while the idea of applying insecticide to a flower might seem tempting, we strongly recommend against doing that because we don't wanna harm pollinators. Um, and then come next April or May, you can always apply a systemic like imidacloprid to try to fend off the beetles early. <laughs> and hope that maybe sometime Mother Nature kills them in the winter. Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> All right, your next picture comes to us from Lincoln. Um, this is a, a dwarf wing euonymus or euonymus burning bush. She's wondering what causes the leaves to discolor. She has seen some webbing. Yeah, so this looks like a pretty advanced case of spider mites. Mm -hmm. So spider mites are these really tiny mites that you know suck up the plant sap and then they create this webbing too. And spider mites like hot, dry summer weather and it certainly has been hot and dry there for a while. Um, so one thing you can do to avoid spider mites is to just make sure that your plant is well watered and healthy. They like stressed out plants. But since it seems like there's a pretty severe case here, um, you can take a high pressure hose, spray off that plant and dislodge as many mites as you can. You can also try um, biorational insecticides like neem or insecticidal soap and that should help too. Are, are there more than one generation? Do they need to worry about that later? Yeah, so there's um, several generations of spider mites. And so one thing you can do is get a sheet of white paper and put it underneath the plant and kind of just bat the plant. And you can see if mites end up on the white paper, they're quite a bit easier to see against that white than on the plant itself. All right, Kate. And then your next two are uh, a butterfly bush. I did amazingly well for two or three years. This year looks really sad. Uh, does face south, it 
wonders, is this fungus, is this weather, is this insects, what is this? I would say this is the same thing, that this is also spider mites. So same recommendations, you know, get the hose out, spray and try to dislodge as many of those mites as you can, and then you can try insecticides too. Right, and I do know that the, the uh, butterfly bushes that were outside Entomology Hall oh, no. are no longer. Oh no. <laughs> because of the spider mites, they, they gave up. All right, Rock. Um, your first one here is Midtown Omaha Garden, and she said the, the, the planting bed seems to like it a lot. So does she keep it or kill it? And I think you have a second, <clears throat> excuse me, a second picture that uh, this one popped up in the lettuce in a raised bed, and uh, the shape reminded this person of a melon plant, and then they saw the spikes. So what are we looking at here? The buffalo burr, it's a pretty common weed in Nebraska. It's an annual, and it pulls up relatively easy. But I will caution you, those spikes will stick. So you gotta make sure you're wearing gloves when you, when you do it and um, pull them out because they come up relatively easily. You know, something like preen can do, it works relatively well as a pre-emergent in the garden, but usually they don't really infest. I mean, I notice flowers on that catch it before it produces the burrs and, and the seed gets out because at that point in time, um, it's just gonna spread. But if you get on it really quickly um, and you're just seeing it for the first time, you can generally hand weed it out relatively easily. Just once again, be wearing, um, you know, very, heavy gloves because those spikes are hard, they sting, I mean, not like a bee, but they, they do sting and, and um, they're hard to get out and you're sitting there with tweezers after you, I've, I've made this mistake more than once. Don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> and you did say annual, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, your next two pictures are Miller, Nebraska, and they're getting a lot of this particular weed in the pastures. They wanna know uh, whether we can identify it and will it take over if not controlled? Uh, this is really an interesting one. It's relatively um, rare in Nebraska. It, it's um, uh, wild Job's tears. And if you look at this picture that's on the screen right now, you can see these little filaments and then there's a little white or yellowish dot at the end. That's what they're saying, wild joe, because they go all over and they blow in the wind. It's a native perennial, usually along the eastern seaboard, um, but it has, there is evidence of it in uh, the prairie areas of Nebraska. And, you know, um, so it, it, is, it is present in Nebraska. At first I thought maybe we'd have something that wasn't normal here and we might be able to document mm -hmm. that. Um, it, it's not very invasive. It, you know, the seed viability and stuff is fine, but, but you know, if you've got good grass in your prairie or other plants, it shouldn't choke it out. But it's kind of a nice little addition because of its so uniqueness. And it's actually threatened or endangered along the East Coast in a number mm -hmm. of places so if you're willing and it you know there's no toxicity to wildlife and that sort of stuff so if you're willing let it go okay as opposed to trying to to eradicate it, it. Yep. yeah all right thank you rock um your next one amy is central lincoln okay june 28th found these little things they're about the size of a pea and they were gone a few days later and we had two or three people send us pictures of this in this last week so this is one of those slime molds. Um, we have various forms. This is actually a kind of a nice little colored one. Um, usually we see them in our mulch. They feed on organic matter, dead organic, AKA the mulch. And we usually see them after a major rain event or watering pattern. Nothing to worry about, they're good guys. And they're fun. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, this is an Omaha viewer, your next picture. Black stuff on an oak branch that fell out of the tree. Uh, she said it was it feels kind of gooey and the tree has been sparse and it's been dropping these. So I, I suspect her real question is, is this killing the tree? Is this killing the tree? Right. I will be honest, I had to actually go and read the question because I'm like, oh, this is a prunus species, not an oak tree. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an oak. Um, this is actually the fruiting body of a heartwood or canker. And so with that tree being sparse, it's because the canker is affecting the mobility of the f nutrients and water in that, in that tree. And so this canker is to the point that it's starting to produce its fruit, um, the spores that will go and infest another tree. So the bad news is your tree is declining. Mm -hmm. um, how long your tree will last is very hard to say. I would say, recommend that this fall um, you start looking at what trees you would like to replace it with mm -hmm. and make that replacement and have some fun with that new tree. And have an arborist look at it in case it's a hazard. Yes, that too. Yeah, all right, good. So your next one is La Vista 
and black and white spots in the lawn, and uh, they think these are eggs. What is this? This is another slime mold mm -hmm. on turf. Um, they get really pretty. We could, this is a gray one, but we have seen blues and purples. Um, once again, moisture related. If you don't like it, and when you mow it, it will be gone. If you want to get rid of it sooner, just take a blast of water and it washes right off. It's all superficial. All right, and your final two are, uh, this is La Vista. And they're wondering, is there any way to rescue this turf? It's only a five-year-old. It was a super turf two, tall fescue, resistant to brown patch. Um, doesn't irrigate at night excessively. What's going on here? And we've Brock got can turf guy too. Yeah, so you this. guys can back um, and forth on this one. This picture shows it really nice. There's that piece of blade going to the left side of the screen. You see that white lesion with a really dark border and they're kind of blotchy. This is typical brown patch. That is what you have. So one of the things with brown patch, yeah, we recommend resistant varieties. Um, I don't know much about that variety, rock and resistance. It's actually a blend, um, Amy. So it's a blend of multiple, you know, to me, there's really no resistant varieties. They're, they're tolerance. And then when they mix a lot of tolerance together, the mycelia can't jump from leaf to leaf and cause some of the problem. Okay. Um, th those sort of things, but you know, brown patch because of the rain, the cycles we had in Lincoln and Omaha, we got this rain and then it got really dry and hot, and and then we got nighttime temperatures in the 75, 78 zone, and then daytime temperatures in the 98 to 100 zone. Um, <laughs> it's not surprising to me, even in quote unquote a resistant variety, but I don't believe there's truly a resistant okay. tall fescue out there. I just don't think it exists. So, uh, but you know, the nice thing is it grows out of it and, it, and it's fine. Yeah. yeah, once the weather patterns change, it will be yep. perfectly fine. Right, and it's turf. Just mow it off and... <laughs> if really? you have something coming up, I was always told you can spray paint it green if you have a big family event. Exactly. And spray really? Did you say it's just turf? I did say it's just turf. <laughs> can I leave? <laughs> you know, our garden is maturing and starting to put on a real show and it's not turf. And of course, we feature all the America selections and Tonight, Terry James is going to highlight one of them. Let's take a minute to see what's happening out in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we're gonna begin looking at our All America Selection winners for 2021. The first one we're gonna look at is a vegetable winner, an edible vegetable winner called Goldilocks. It is a small acorn squash it's actually one of those that we always talk about being bred for smaller containers. So this one will only get to be a, about 30 inches tall. So it's really that bush-like small uh, plant. And it's gonna have some really cute pumpkin looking, acorn squash looking fruit on it that are about four by four and about one pound each. So they're gonna be excellent for cutting in half and roasting and that stuff in the fall. We had a little bit of rain here in Lincoln, so things are looking good. Still gonna have to put a little bit of that supplemental water on our garden. So walk through your garden, make sure that you're doing those great IPM techniques and stop by the backyard farmer garden and check it out. Right now it is time for the lightning round. Amy, you are first up. I've never started. I don't know how this works. <laughs> you get one minute, just like okay. you do when you're not <laughs> starting. <laughs> All right, this is, a, <laughs> this is a Nebraska City viewer and uh, their oaks are looking poorly, curled leaves, etc. Mm -hmm. Is this a symptom of oak wilt? We have not found oak wilt in Nebraska, so no. All right. Is there a disease of roses that causes the leaves to look rusty? We do have rose rust. And so if you flip it over, you see, should see those orange pustules and it will wipe off with your finger. And the same viewer wants to know, what do you do about? There are some great fungicides that you can put on your roses to uh, combat it. Sanitation is gonna be huge, um, but the spores blow in from the south. All right, this is a Paxton viewer who wants to know, is it too late or too early to treat for cedar apple rust? It is too late. Um, your apples have already produced and we don't treat the cedar trees. All right, and then their next question is, what product would you use to treat the apples? We have a wonderful NEB guide on cedar apple rust with a list of 
fungicides, or otherwise follow any of the fruit tree fungicide application guides. All right, nice job. Perfect, right on time. Woohoo! Ready? Yeah. <laughs> this is a Page, Nebraska viewer, Rock. They uh, they want to know uh, zoysia grass or buffalo grass in a part shade situation in sandy soil or neither. Uh, buffalo grass will do f fine in partial shade. I'm not a big fan of zoysia because it's not. It has all kinds of issues that I don't care for, especially large patch and some other pathogens, et cetera. So I would go with buffalo grass. Uh, partial shade is fine. Um, there's plenty of great seed out there, including multiple ones from um, our program. Sundancer is one we would recommend. And uh, within the next year, we'll have another new one out there. So consider Sundancer buffalo grass as a choice instead of zoysia. All right, and lightning round, Blue Hill wants to know how to control purslane. Uh, Persane is better consoled with a pre-emergence, um, usually in the in the spring of the year, later in the season. Um, controlling it once it up is really kind of a waste of everyone's time. All right, uh, this is a carny viewer who wants to know the name of the chemical that we recommend for killing bindweed. Um, my chemical, my the the two four D flocks of pure combination that's called the. Um, Poison ivy killer, I was, I was, yeah, I'm gonna get two, but whatever. Poison <laughs> ivy killer will work best on vine weed. Well, and you got it right, because this that actually was a question that Matt answered, and they couldn't, this viewer is following up with that, and it was the one that started with F. Philoxapir. Yeah, okay, all right, that was fine, that was fine. All right, Kate, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Uh, this is a viewer who apparently has carpenter ants and wants to know if one of those home perimeter spray things will work to get rid of the carpenter ants. Um, if the ants are outside, it'll help prevent them from coming in, but if you have an infestation in the home, then you should contact a pest management professional. All right. We have a viewer who wondered uh, whether Fletcher scale attacks junipers and arborvitae. Um, they prefer you, but they will attack those other ones. All right, and their, their follow-up question, of course, then is how do you control Fletcher scale? Um, same thing, wait till the crawlers and then you can apply an insecticide. All right, um, a Grand Island viewer wants to know, um, should they use those Japanese beetle bags or traps? No, because those traps often attract way too many beetles to your landscape that you don't want, so we strongly recommend against using those. All right, we have a viewer who wants to know, is milky spore effective against grubs? Um, it is, but it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's an answer. Y yeah. <laughs> All right. This is a Lindsay, Nebraska viewer who has really twiggy growth on hackberry. Anything to do about that? I'll pass on that one. Yeah. Because you can't do anything anyway. It's, so can I follow up on great. the milky spore one? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <Please> so do. <laughs> my, my understanding on the milky spore is that it works on Japanese beetles, but it doesn't work on mass chafers, nor does it work on the three-year grubs. So your yes or no answer, I think, was correct. But you know, prior to having Japanese beetles, we strongly recommended against using milky spore because it only works on. It's very specific to Japanese beetles. Correct. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so great answer. <laughs> <laughs> it was the lightning round, short and simple. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Amy, would you like Plants of the Week? Sure. Me to do it. Uh, we have today a one of the very first butterfly bushes uh, blooming, and this is actually in the backyard farmer garden. It's been there 11 years. It is extremely fragrant. You can probably smell it. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's already attracting butterflies. And then also blooming at exactly the same time, we have Queen of the Prairie. And this is uh, in the bottom of our rain chain. So this is one that likes a moist condition. It has interesting whorl leaves up the stem, gets three to four feet tall. Kind of reminds a lot of people of a stilby a little bit, uh, a little fluffy. Doesn't really last very long, but it's really a, a nice one for the bottom of the rain chain. So a couple really nice ones. And for no other reason than the beautiful smell, plant butterfly bush, and then you get the butterflies. All right, so your next set of questions, Kate. Um, the first one is uh, Albion, Nebraska. And these insects are eating the alyssum. She, she has never had it happen before. She's tried a three-in-one treatment. She's tried neem oil. And uh, what do we have here for? So this is a species of weevil. 
And weevils are a type of beetle and they're one of the most diverse group of organisms in the whole world. And they're actually pretty cute. As far as insects go, they kind of have this long snout. Um, it's not their nose, it's actually their mouth and they have these little chewing mouth parts at the end of it that can cause damage like you're seeing here in the picture. As far as control, it's really not economical with these types of weevils to really apply anything. You can take the Japanese beetle route if you see a lot of those adults and kind of just bat them in some soapy water. All right, uh, your next two pictures are an Omaha viewer. A coneflower stem with eggs or larvae. So, um, and she said the little white eggs seem to have a black dot on them. Are these good guys or bad guys? So I would consider these bad guys. It's a little bit difficult to tell from the pictures, but this might be the brown marmorated stink bug. And those eggs do look like brown marmorated stink bug eggs. And they do eat um, around 200 different species of plant. You know, they're not huge pests in the garden here in Nebraska. Um, more often we see them as pests getting inside the home in the fall. So you wanna make sure that you, you know, go around, make sure you seal holes with caulk, make sure your screens are there. But yeah, I would say stink bug. All right. Uh, and your final picture is Springfield. What is this? It has been on his grapevine for several years. This year there are a lot of them. Well, the easy answer is the common name is the grapevine beetle. Um, <laughs> and that's because the adults do eat grapevine leaves. They don't cause enough damage to really warrant any control. Um, but if they do kind of get out of hand, you can always just pick the adults off of the leaves. All right, excellent. Okay, Rock, uh, this is a, 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 these are Lincoln viewers. And this is a section of the lawn that's been overtaken with spurge. They've battled it by digging, spraying, selective pulling, stripping, replanting. <laughs> what do they do? Well, normally when we see spurge, and that's like an award-winning infestation, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, normally when we see this much spurge, then there's an underlining soil problem because spurge really likes compacted, heavily compacted soils. So it's along a sidewalk. So maybe, you know, people are walking along there and the turf is always going to struggle there a little bit. My suggestion would be to get, the, you know, a core aerator this spring right now. I mean, you could spray it down if you want. Certainly any of the broadleaf herbicides would burn it back. Uh, but those, the amount of seed it produces is really uh, borders on traumatic when it comes to its capacity to spread. Um, so bottom line is, is you've got to get that soil condition improved, get rid of the compaction, core aerate, do whatever you need to do, and then reseed you know, this next fall, which is the perfect time for seeding. Later on the show, we can make a recommendation of what to plant, but right now, the, the only thing they can do is spray for revenge and then try to take care of the, uh, of the uh, compacted soil, because that's, I think it's so aggressive because of that compacted soil. All right, Re revenge spraying. There, there ought to be a spray named revenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your next one here is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, got a bad rash, uh, said poison ivy. Couldn't find any in the area. Does this look like poison ivy to you? Or? That is not poison ivy. That's right. Boston ivy, right. um, which is, could have been brought in by a seed right. from a bird or whatever because the birds see, feed on the seed. And the key identifier is if, if you consider, um, you know, the three leaves, the middle leaf um, has a long, uh, um, stem on it, you know, there's a, it, and that, that's not even remotely close to how big uh, um, poison ivy would be, but that's, you know, leaves of three, let it be, but in this case, it's an ivy and it's not a problem. All right, and you actually have a, a, a follow-up question from a different viewer from Springfield who wonders if it is poison ivy, how do you get rid of it, especially if it's under an apple tree and adjacent to a garden? So now we've got the problem of wanting to spray <laughs> A, you know, don't move or remove it by hand, especially if any of you in the family are hypersensitive. Don't remove it and then burn it because if you stand downwind, you're gonna get affected as well. You know, poison ivy is, is extremely toxic and creates rashes and all the things. Those are those people that are really, especially people that are sensitive to it. So, so now we're gonna suggest that you go in and hand wipe. You know, there's some really good products out there that are called poison ivy killers, and it's a combination of broadleaf herbicides designed to control, but you know, you can put on a, um, a plastic glove, you can put on a cotton glove over it, and you can spray it with a ready to use glyphosate or, or broadleaf herbicide, and then just go in and wipe it on the leaves. You can use a paintbrush. If you try to target spray in there, then we run the risk of drift and damage to the, to the sensitive ornamentals as well as the, uh, I assume it's a vegetable garden adjacent mm -hmm. to it. So that's what I would suggest doing there. Uh, you can't really dig it up, especially in that area. And 
if it, if it's indeed um, poison ivy. Just make sure it's poison ivy before you you know you make that sort of drastic leap. All right, thanks, Rock. And your next two pictures are um, these two weeds started up uh, showing up a few years ago in my lawn in Hebron. Now they're blooming and everywhere. So we got. I think this one and I think we have a second one. What are these and how do you get rid of them? Yeah, they're both plantains. They're two different species, buckthorn and common or, or broadly plantain. Um, you know, they, they've got a very characteristic seed head on them. It would have been nicer had you been able to, or get in there with a mower and it appears that are in turf because they are prolific seeders. Mm -hmm. um, they are annuals, but they'll come, they'll, they will um, reproduce by seed very readily. So what you want to do is get them sprayed before the seed sets, which is like right now. Um, also, they're an indicator of a compacted soil, much like spurge is, right? And we generally see them along in thinner areas of turf. So get that turf up and healthy. You may want to burn them down now. Once again, that would be a revenge spray more than anything. Uh, but get this, keep the seed heads mowed down. All right, thanks, Rock. All right, Amy, you brought a coneflower, mm -hmm. and here is a coneflower question. Uh, they planted them last August. A few days ago, the leaves are spotted and dying. The stems are turning brown. Uh, they were doing well. Uh, last pic shows that there is a little insect, but her question is, is this, you know, the aster yellows? Is this insect? Is this a leaf spot? What is this? So the great thing about coneflowers, besides the one I brought, they're very disease resistant. Um, there really isn't a leaf spot mm -hmm. or a stem spot that we're worried about. But the way these leaves are curling up and turning brown, Kate already talked about it, probably spider mites. Mm -hmm. um, so get in there and look for that webbing and see for those little crawly dudes. Uh, the weather's just been perfect for them. All right, your next one is actually a clematis and she's wondering what she should do. She says there's a downspout about 30 feet uphill that she diverts. We thought maybe it was, it was dry from, she sent some previous uh, mm -hmm. questions. Uh, there is a ground cover at the base. Is this virus, is this nutrition? To me this, to me this screams nutrition. I cannot pinpoint what nutrition it actually is. I didn't take enough time to look at clematis. Um, I would give it some fertilizer. Um, a good concentration of the MP and K. Um, it's probably one of those three major macros and see if that makes a difference. All right, and your, your final two are, uh, this is Midtown Omaha. Brown spots on the leaves spreading to the whole shrub and she, and she thinks maybe some of the branches are dying. Um, this has come up rather suddenly. suddenly. She said, no, it's not drought because I asked the follow-up question. Okay, and they're in Omaha, correct? Mm -hmm. So, Omaha, you have received some significant rains here lately. Um, Iowa's reported major cases of bacterial blight mm -hmm. of lilac. And if you look at it, it kind of, the spots kind of follow the patterns where water would run. Um, this is really a not good disease. Mm -hmm. So eradication and removal is the big thing. And, and you saw how that lilac, that core was really, um, defoliated, I would recommend that we prune it out. Every prune cut though, you need to clean your clippers just mm -hmm. to alleviate the potential of you moving that bacteria around. Now with lilacs, we can prune them down fairly heavily. Um, remember if you prune them down too heavy, you're not gonna have blossoms because that's, you're killing those flowers right now. Um, but you know, if what I've learned from Kim and everything else on so Backyard Farmer, take a third of the plant, mm -hmm. um, reduce it down by a third, and then you should be able to control that bacterial blight. All right, thanks, Amy. Well, as we showed you earlier in the show, we proudly have an All-America Selections display garden at our spot on East Campus. But exactly how does a plant go from just being an ordinary old ornamental or a vegetable to being an All-America Selection? Here's Scott Evans to tell us about the process. Each year, when we walk into our favorite garden center, we are hit with hundreds of new varieties of plants. But do you ever stop and wonder how are those new introductions selected? Do they go through a judging process? That's where all American selection comes into play. AAS is the nation's oldest independent testing organization for both flowers and edibles. My colleague, John Porter, and I are judges for AAS. 
and each year AAS will receive plant material from plant breeders and it's distributed to the different gardens across the nation. Today we are at one of our perennial trial gardens here at the Serpy County Fairgrounds in Springfield that's managed by the Douglas Serpy Extension Master Gardeners. We received three new perennial introductions and we have their comparisons and this um, judging process is going to last for up to three years because we know that it takes a little while for the perennials to get into the ground, establish, so they can get a, a good show of flowers. So today we're going to talk about the judging process and go over some of the characteristics that we're looking for. The first plant we're going to talk about is the hardy hibiscus. And what we're going to be looking at is some characteristics such as the overall plant habit, because we know that the hibiscus can get unruly as it matures. So we're going to be looking at how neat and tidy is that plant in the landscape. We're going to be looking at the showiness of the flower. We're going to be comparing that flower to the comparison to see if it's a significant improvement. And we're actually going to be looking at the leaf shape and color of this plant because this particular introduction has some really unique characteristics of that bronze foliage. But again, we're going to compare it to the comparison to see if it holds up to a plant that's already on the market. The next plant that we're going to take a look at is the sedum. This plant is unique because it's actually grown from a seed. It's a plant that, uh, that seed is not on the market quite yet, so don't go out looking for it. But we are going to be looking at the timing of the flower. Are we going to get a nice long bloom time from the sedum? And we're going to look at the plant habit. Because as we know, some of our sedums have a tendency to flop in the center. So we're going to be seeing if this sedum will have strong sturdy stems to stay upright. And then the last plant that we have to judge um, this year is the blue flax. If you've ever grown flax before, you know it can be a little bit challenging here in Nebraska. So one of the characteristics that we are looking for is the winter survivability. How many plants survive the winter? Now we won't know that until next year, but it's something that we'll be judging for. We're going to be looking at the plant, um, the blooming time of the flower. Is it a nice long bloom? We're going to look at the plant habit. Is it, is it a plant that looks good in flower and out of flower? And we're going to be looking at the drought resistant, which is a characteristic that a lot of us look for nowadays. So the next time you're at your favorite garden center and you want to choose a plant that you know that has gone through a rigorous judging process, look for the AAS seal on all of those collar tags. Lots of criteria and some really intensive study goes into being passed as an All-America selection. And of course, that is to ensure that you're getting something that has been proven successful should do well in your home landscape if you pay attention to it. <laughs> All right, Kate, um, we have a, let's see, your next question here is, Ogallala found these burrowing holes in the blossoming crab apple tree. Any treatments for, su uh, suggestions for treatment or are they going to lose it? And there are two pictures here. So there is a couple of layers of what's happening here. That first picture is a giant ichneumon wasp. And what it's actually doing, it has this really long ovipositor that it's shimmying into the wood in order to parasitize a wood boring insect. In this case, that insect is likely a horntail or a wood wasp. And unfortunately, if your tree has wood wasps at this point, it's probably beyond saving. Ooh. All right, unfortunate on that one. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, your next one here is found these on irises that were growing on top of an ash tree stump. And she did send a picture of larvae that looked like they were emerging, but it, it, they were uh, a little blurry, about an inch long larva. Yeah, so this is a really cool find because it's not something that you see every day here. This is a Midas fly and they're a relatively large, I would say a beautiful fly as far as flies <laughs> go. Um, 
But yeah, I would leave them be because the larvae are actually, they live in the soil and they're beneficial predators. So they'll be eating things like white grubs and other insect pests that we don't want. And you said Midas as in Midas. gold. Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, and then your final picture here is what type of caterpillars they are quickly destroying her plant. Yeah, so these look like checker spot caterpillars. Um, I'd need to know what kind of plant it is to be sure, but they certainly look like the silvery checker spot. And usually if you see one caterpillar, there's going to be a lot of them like you see in this picture. Um, because they turn into a butterfly, you know, their feeding slows down as they get bigger like we see here. So I really wouldn't recommend doing anything and just letting them be to become butterflies. Um, if you want, you can have a sacrificial plant and move caterpillars all to one. I've done that before, <laughs> but other than that, yeah. Enjoy, all right, thanks. Rock, uh, this is uh, two pictures, Western Douglas County on an acreage, and he's got these growing wild. They're black locusts, uh, A and B here. I think you have two. They currently cut them down and treat with Tordon, but they keep coming back. Is that what should be happening with black locust and its suckering habit? Well, it's, you know, it's a strong sucker, and so when you spray it, you know, and, and it cut stem, toward on applications generally work on most woody species, and they're mm -hmm. going to work, but the thing is, is then you stimulate that plant to then produce all the shoots, and it's got a really intense, um, extensive underground system of rhizomes, so they're just going to have to be patient. But the cut stem treatments, the nice thing about that is you're not spraying, you know, you're putting on, usually on with a paintbrush, um, and then you don't get the tort on, on the other things, because if there's desirable woody material in there, you can cause some injury to that too. But cut stem is the way to go, and, and it's just be really, really persistent. All right, and your, your next one is actually also one about suckers. This is Tiger Eyes Sumac, which I think you have at home or had. Yep. Uh, cut it down last spring, and now, <laughs> in revenge, it's all over everything. <laughs> he pulls, he mows, they keep coming back as they're just laughing at his effort. How do you get rid of them? Well, and, you know, the, and then it's even more challenging because it's in the ornamental bed right. as well as in the lawn. In the lawn, it's relatively easy to control. Uh, with, it, it, I don't know if he was adverse to using um, a herbicide, but you know, herbicide would would work very effectively in there. It would probably take multiple applications, and not right now when it's warm, but wait wait until it's um, cooling off in the fall of the year. That would cut them back. You might actually get translocation back, but that the root system under there, once again, extensive root system. It's a sumac, and it's going to keep on popping these sprouts. So spot spraying them in the garden bed with a glyphosate compound, or out in the lawn with a any broadleaf herbicide, and it's going to be a persistent thing. Mowing them isn't going to do anything. Thing, but irritate them and make them want to grow more prolifically. Right? All right. So that's, that's so right. The, yeah, not, not a good use of time for, for mowing them. All right. Uh, this is a Yankton, South Dakota viewer, Amy, a first time gardener, and something is slowly killing his tomatoes. First plant started willing four weeks ago. Now it's spreading to adjacent plants. He's pulled three already. Any thoughts on this? So you're up in that Yankton, South Dakota area where you're leaning toward that extreme drought. My first question is, are they getting enough water? Um, just because they look dry to me, and it's maybe where you're at now was a, able to hold a little bit more water than where they were at. So I would look at water first. If you have been watering and the soil is damp and not soaking wet, um, there are some root rots and vascular wilts that will move in. Um, but I don't see them real common, so I would look at that watering thing first. All right, uh, your next one is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, lesions on the tomatoes, leaves are curling and dying. So, you know, we go back and forth. On this tomato, it kind of maybe would look like bacterial speck, but here's the biggest thing to identify bacterial speck. You can take your fingernail and scrape it right off. Mm -hmm. um, it's very superficial. If that doesn't scrape off, it's probably a better indication that you have a sucking mouth part insect mm -hmm. that is probing, and my probers that I usually see are stink bugs. They just probe and probe and probe and until they find something they like to eat, and they don't like to eat tomatoes. All right, and your final one quickly is a Harvard viewer. What is going on with the Viking potatoes? Your Viking tomato, our potatoes have wonderful scab. Yeah. Um, Soil-borne pathogen um, does not hurt you to eat it. You can peel it right off, but it's a beautiful case of scab. All right, 